Hello. Thank you. Cool, you know me. Um, so yes, as I said, my name's uh, Sam Mitchin. I do interesting stuff with phones, mostly. Um, for my sins, I've also been managing the, the phone operations here, so the various things we had, like decked and bits and pieces of what's the desk phones and some of the stuff that Matthew talked about with connecting the POTS phones. Um, I've I overseen the phone network. But I also um, get involved with doing things with artists um, that want to do interesting creative technology stuff um, through various connections. Um, and this is a story um, about a project I got involved in, I'm trying to cut the dates out, about four years ago, um, four or five years ago now. Uh, and it's sort of, the journey it took um, and what went wrong um, and what we discovered and things. Um, so the project itself is called Pick Me Up and Hold Me Tight and it was a creative piece. Um, I'll come on to, to the background a bit more but just as I said, the, the content warning, the project itself was, was brought about to raise awareness of male suicide. Um, this talk is predominantly about the implementation so we're not really going too much into the content. Um, there is a video we might play which talks a bit about the creative side and there's an opportunity for you to try it. If you've got a decked phone with you, um, keep it out because at the end we'll try a live demo which will probably break everything because that's always fun. But um, yeah, this is predominantly a, a technical or a, a narrative talk of, of building technology. Um, so yeah, hence the war dialing the payphone estate. <laughs> um, so yeah, how it started. Back in summer of 2018, um, I discovered this project called Pick Me Up and Hold Me Tight. Um, with some friends, it was launching a crowdfunder, and the aim of the project was, they said, on the 1st of January, um, they didn't say which year, we, at 11 a.m., we are gonna make every payphone in the UK ring at the same time, um, as a art, since art piece um, to raise awareness of male suicide. Um, apparently, 1st of January, New Year's Day, 11 a.m. is one of the peak times for, for that kind of thing. So it was, you know, and payphones, there's a lot of connections to, you know, loneliness and obviously Samaritans, lots of people call via payphones, every payphone you go into, and they, and they still keep payphones in certain locations, which, you know, might be prominent for, for that. Um, and I just thought it sounded like a really interesting project. Um, it was, a, you know, a good, worthy cause, and I was kind of interested in the tech side of it as to, wow, okay, making all the payphones ring at once, that's not easy. Um, so I put 20 quid into the crowdfunder via a friend um, and sort of said, oh, that sounds really interesting. You know, I'd love to know how they're going to do it. Um, and I got an email back from the guy behind it saying, um, Claire says you know stuff about phones. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'd love to know what your plans are. And he's like, do you know how we can make all the payphones ring? <laughs> so I thought I was backing a project to find out how they were going to do it. And it turned out that I was the one that was going to do it. <laughs> um, which is kind of the story of my life, really. But um, So, yeah, we, they started off with a crowdfunder um, on... It wasn't Kickstarter, but one of these kind of... But more of an arts platform, I can't remember which one. Um, and initially, BT payphones, the, the, the payphone division of BT, excuse me, um, were, were kind of on board as a supporter. It was a project that they were like, yes, we'll, you know, we'll help where we can, um, as long as it doesn't require them doing any work or giving you any money, basically. Um, so really, they had a creative vision. Um, so George and Jada, the, the two creative directors behind the project, had, a, had an idea as to what they wanted the, the creative piece to look like, but no real idea how they were going to deliver this. Um, I think they'd done a few little things with small kind of payphones with a couple of hacks on Twilio. Um, at the time, um, BT, BT's payphone, U, UK payphones list, so we'll, we'll go into the different types of payphones later, but there was 34,000 payphones in the UK on their list as of summer 2018. Um, and we actually had an Excel file with the numbers, locations of every payphone at the time um, that were BT public payphones. So what that kind of is, is the, the ones basically on the street. So there are certain ones that you might think are BT post. Obviously the ones in like pubs and things that don't look like, you know, that are just run by the pub might not be, but also all the ones in railway stations didn't count, all the ones in shopping centers, anything kind of on private property was, was a separate subset. But we had all the public ones, which was, you know, a pretty good definition of payphone. Um, so yeah, we started, or I started figuring out how I was gonna make this thing work. <laughs> So lots of conversations with the artists. What do they actually want this kind of experience to be? Um, what do they, you know, um, how do they, what happens? Okay, I make all the payphones ring, then what? Um, 
And so they had a, at the time, interactive audio piece. So it was um, a lot around kind of listening and you know, understanding people. And it guided you through asking you questions around how good a listener do you think you are and asking you to like press one to five um, to, to answer this kind of survey thing. And then at the end, it would do some, some, some maths on looking at the answers you'd put in and give you a sort of feedback on, on your listening skills. Um, which, you know, actually relatively easy. Anybody that's done phone development, okay, you want to make an outbound call and you want to drop that into an IVR and collect inputs and play some audio files and then do a little bit of logic with, with the inputs at the end. Um, so I started prototyping stuff. Um, I was working for Nexmo at the time, so using you know, a, any of those kind of platforms are quite easy for building this stuff, and, and we worked through a lot of the creative stuff. Um, and at the same time, um, talking to or designing the, the platform as to how am I going to do that many calls at, at once, so to speak. Um, and, and there was a little bit of discussion around, OK, when you say at 11 AM you want all the phones to ring, do you want like literally click, tick over 11 AM, every single payphone is in sync? Or you know, how much leeway do we really have here? Is within 15 minutes fine you know, if, if they all ring sometime from 11 to, between 11 and 11.15? Um, and we had lots of back and forward. So finding that kind of balancing act as to what's, what's really feasible, because actually to try and dump 34,000 calls in sync was probably not going to be particularly easy. Um, and, and had some conversations with BT, because we had BT at the time as a partner, um, about, hey, can I send you 34,000 calls? Um, you know, where do you want me to send them? Um, <laughs> and, and they were a little bit kind of, uh, that's a lot of traffic at once. Um, can you do, we can do 500 a second. <laughs> but that was, yeah, the, the limiting side of, of any of their platforms. They didn't have any sort of in integration points. But, you know, we were, we, were, we were progressing. So the plan was to do a pilot um, in Liverpool because one of the creative institutions that was, in, um, that was involved was, was the Liverpool... Now, Liverpool Arts Institute or something, um, on the 1st of Jan 2019. Um, so we, we were actually going to use just a, a third-party SIP provider. The number of phones in Liverpool was, was a couple of hundred. We'd identified for our list, so it was a, a small-scale kind of pilot. Um, and then on the 18th of December, so 12 days before we're due to go and a week before Christmas, um, BT pulled out. They said, no, we're not kind of, we're not really happy with the project. We've decided not. Um, not so much from a technical standpoint around the traffic, um, because we were just, we, we, I was sorting that. Um, actually, what they were more concerned about was basically anything drawing attention to payphones, um, because they were all in a pretty poor state, the amount that were broken, um, you know, not working, vandalized, generally filthy, disgusting condition. Um, and payphones, it turns out, you know, within BT are obviously a bit of a, they're not exactly the glamorous end of the business, are you? You're not, you're not doing 5G and fiber broadband if you're the head of payphones. Um, so yeah, they, they, they pulled out. So we, we kind of had to just, you know, two week, week before Christmas, it was like, okay, this is, this is not gonna be feasible to kind of, we have to rethink a bit of this. Um, so we, we put a hold on it. Um, early 2019, we, we got back and sort of said, okay, can we do this without BT? So at the time we were using BT's list of, of data. One of the key things they've given us was this list of payphones. Um, and if they've sort of pulled out of the project, is that really our date? You know, do we, do we, can we still legitimately use that? So we had lots of conversations with lawyers. Um, and the output of it was that we decided that we would source alternative payphone data. So there are, as anyway, there are various lists floating around the internet of lists of payphone numbers in the UK. Um, so between that, with that um, and some, some human intervention, um, we distilled down to a, a unique list um, and we kind of knew what sort of numbers we were aiming for, so we, we had a reasonable idea. But, um, so we, we, we created our own list of, of payphone data, um, and we spread the calls out. So, we, we, so actually we, we'll do it over 30 minutes, we'll, we'll scale that back a bit, um, with a plan to do our pilot in Leeds um, on the 1st of Jan 2020. So we basically delayed a year. Um, then, so we, we moved to Leeds, um, and we actually sent some people out. We, we recruited a whole bunch of volunteers. I think we had 60, 70 volunteers who went round with our list of payphones in Leeds and, and audited them and basically said, right, here's a list of payphones. Can you go and check if they're still there, if the number is what they think it is, um, all kinds of things, you know, see if you find any others. Um, and, and they took photos, which was really handy because it's like, okay, send us back a photo of 
of each one just so we can get an idea. So these are just some of the, the photos that got dumped in. Um, you can see down the bottom there, particularly these ones with the screens, these are these new in-link kiosks that are sort of appearing, which are a whole other talk in themselves. But basically, they're an advertising board. Um, but by putting a payphone in it, they can avoid the need for planning permission. Um, to actually put up an advertising hoard. Um, so they put a tiny little phone on the edge of the thing and a great big bill, digital billboard on it, but it's BT can install payphones on the public highway without needing planning permission or, or paying rent to the council or anything. So they use that as a loophole to, uh, to sell advertising. Um, and actually the calls on them are free um, because it's not worth charging for that. They make more money off the ads on the, on the billboard and they don't have to put a sensor around to collect the 50Ps out the box. Um, so, you know, we were, we were kind of on, on target, um, and then we hit some technical difficulties. So somewhere around the summer of 2019, um, so we said before, this was, we were doing this survey thing. In, in, you, know, you called, you picked up, and then it asked you to press one to five based on your answers. Um, BT made a change to their payphones that prevented DTMF, so the keypad, working if it was an incoming call. Um, I still don't really know why they did this, necessarily how I, I mean you know I can, they, payphones all have a digital kind of they call back for a control um, so but they I don't think it was kind of to, to scupper us I think this was just uh, somewhere along the line somebody rolled out some new software and they nobody ever really ever considered this use case because actually nothing ever that you know one payphones very rarely receive incoming calls and payphones almost never receive incoming calls from automated systems that then ask you to navigate a menu um, so we, we were kind of an edge case here that we, we caught up on but somewhere along the line they changed that um, so that kind of you know gave us another another spanner in the works so we we had to rewrite um, really this was more a problem i mean it was a problem for me for the first few months because we started just getting initial reports on these tests going out in leads of like I called, I answered, I picked up, but it wasn't, wouldn't do anything. And I'm like, that's weird. And I was trying it. I was like, well, the IVR stuff works fine on my phone. I went to like the payphone in my village, um, still worked. Um, and, you know, it, we were trying to track it down. That's why we, we started getting a lot of the photos of the payphones. It's like, well, send me a photo of the phone. It works. And I was trying to work out if there were certain models maybe it didn't work on or were they using like some non-BT ones or something. Um, but it, it just seems to be that the software was, was rolling out and the, turns out the payphone in my village that I was using to go and test this on hadn't been updated and was still working and the ones in Leeds got updated sooner. Um, I think actually it was, they were the top of BT's list because it went in area code numbering order and 0113 is, is one of the lowest numerical order num, um, area codes. So, yeah, we had some, um, some fun with that. Once we got to the bottom of it and, and I kind of actually managed to find some phones that it did fail on, um, we, we, we rewrote the audio so it's now just a single plays back a, a nine minute, I think it is, audio file, um, which made the tech a bit easier for me, but so I wasn't collecting inputs. Um, so at this point now, we had a working platform. Um, so I built a, a scalable calling platform, um, a system basically to make a lot of phone calls in a relatively short period of time, um, and we were going to use it for a one-off. We're going to fire this up in, you know, New Year's morning at about nine o'clock, and, we, and we're going to be done with it by midday. Um, so, you know, hence this sounds like an ideal thing for cloud computing. Um, we need a lot of capacity for a very short period of time, but we don't want to pay for it all ahead of that. So I used AWS. Um, Free switch, if you're familiar with it, that was what we use as our calling platform. So the platforms you have like Twilio, Nexmo, these kind of things, you know, the, the programmable communications, these are great, but they have capacity limits. Yeah, I think Twilio limit you to one call per second on a standard plan. Nexmo, I think, is 30 simultaneous calls. Um, they all have some kind of limit like that. So that wasn't really going to scale for our needs. Um, free switch and and just SIP providers who give us, you know, a phone trunk would give us a lot more flexibility in how we do that. Um, and then a little bit of, of serverless kind of back-end control. Um, so we get into the, the slightly more technical part of the talk with a very badly drawn AWS diagram. Um, apologies if anybody works for AWS. I'm sure this breaches a whole bunch of the guidelines. Um, this, was, this was kind of how it, how it all came together. So I keep looking for a screen behind me there, they're here. <laughs> Over on the, the right, um, this was our sort of ingestion. So there was, there was me and a list of CSV files and some Python scripts, um, basically deduping CSV files and trying to get this single set of payphone data into DynamoDB. So Dynamo is where we held the, the records for every one, one record per phone. Um, 
some, some geocoded data. So there was a, effectively a lat long that we took from, from postcodes we mostly had of them, um, the number, a, a description, um, and just an ID that we used internally. Um, they all went into DynamoDB. And then we had a Lambda function, which was actually what would kick off the call, so select all from the, this table on the database um, and drop them into simple queue service, so into, into an SQS queue. So when we want to actually make the call, I just invoked a Lambda trigger from my, from my command line, and we dumped 30-odd thousand records into, into SQS. Um, then we have the kind of the meat of this. This is down the bottom there. We had a whole bunch of EC2 servers. Um, there's six there. I think, we, I think at one point we had 14 in the, in the kind of cluster, or well, not really a cluster because they were individual, um, but all running free switch um, with this audio file on it and the kind of the, the simple dial plan that says call the number when it picks up, play the audio file, um, and a little bit of Python that was just binding it to the SQS queue. So what the free switch bot code was doing was look, sitting on the queue, picking a number off the queue and giving it to free switch and saying place a call. Um, and each free switch box which call, um, the, had a, a limit on the number of simultaneous calls it would handle. So it would basically start dialing numbers until it had however many active calls that box would handle at a time, I think about 100 calls per box. Um, and then when a call ended, either because it had rung out and not been answered or you know, it had been completed or, or whatever, or it failed with an error, it would just pick another number off. So we basically had a big pool of workers pulling numbers off the queue, making phone calls. Um, and then we distributed that across various SIP providers. So again, most of them will, will quite easily, with a credit card and things, give you, you know, 30 channels or something per account. Um, but if you want more, they want like a year's commitment and you have to talk to somebody in sales and probably go out for a steak dinner and, you know, all that kind of stuff that comes with, with telecoms. So we just, um, we just set up a bunch of different SIP accounts. And we didn't really care about the numbers or where it was coming from. Payphones don't really have caller ID. Um, this was a one-off. So we, we farmed the calls out across lots and lots of different SIP providers. I say 14, basically, at the, at, at the most, or 14 accounts. A couple of them we managed to, to double up on. Um, all of those converged back on BT. Um, Obviously, the one nice thing about spreading it across lots of providers is that most of the providers are interconnected with BT at different points. So we weren't sending all the calls into BT's network on like one little local exchange somewhere that was going to get utterly swamped. We were calling across the country. We were distributing our traffic across the country. Um, the, the most central thing was probably, you know, um, EU West 1 in Dublin or something. Um, so all the calls onto BT and then out to the payphones. Um, the other piece I should mention that we did was, as part of the creative, there was a, um, there, there is still a website, um, it, Google picked me up and hold me tight or something, um, it's Zoo UK is the, the arts group behind it, um, they wanted to have a live map showing when the phones were ringing, when they were being answered, all of this kind of thing, like an interactive visual piece to, to, to because actually you need something to sort of to show just an audience as well as the participants. Um, so, you know, this was a, a relatively standard bit of web app stuff. Basically, the free switch box when it, when the call events, when the call was answered or when the call failed or whatever, was publishing those, uh, publishing those events back to SQS. Um, we had a Lambda picking up off that queue and updating the status in the database. So again, DynamoDB was being updated as to whether the phone had been answered or, or not. Um, and we published those out over Pusher, the WebSocket service. Um, and then there's a web page, static web page, bit of JavaScript hosted on an S3 bucket, which when you load the page, it used another Lambda function to pull the historical, what's, what's the current state of the phones that have they all been answered out of the database as a big JSON object and plot push pins on Google Maps. So the, you can see them now, I'll show you a better view of the map, but there's a little icon for every phone on a Google Map and there's a little cluster, a phone, bo phone box icon for when there's a, you know, a clustering of, of them together if you zoom out. Um, so it would update them, and then Pusher would actually update the page as phones were picked up. So as, when phones were ringing, they'd start bouncing. Um, when they were answered, they'd go red. I think it was, they'd change the colors and, and things like that. So it was just a, a bit of an interactive thing. Um, so that's a kind of you know, 34,000 points on a Google map with a bit of real-time updating isn't particularly, particularly interesting. Um, so yeah, we, we ran our leads pilot. Um, it was mostly successful. Um, the, the really big thing here is now we're two, um, about two and a bit years into the project. 
19, 20, no, 18 months sorry, into the project. The years, the last few years have just merged into one. Um, but, you know, we, we were, the thing that was really noticeable was the rate of payphones declining. So I say when we started this project, there was 34,000 on the, the current BT list. Um, we were down to, I think at this point, we reckon there was probably about, 70, about half of that, about 17,000 still active in the UK. And, and falling. So every time our, our data was, was going out of date. And mostly, you know, the, the good thing is the numbers were just disconnected. We were getting, you know, uh, an error code back of various descriptions depending on the provider that was telling us, okay, it looks like that phone's been, been terminated, that line no longer exists, the phone box has been ripped out. And sure enough, occasionally you could check on things like Google Street View. I spent a lot of time kind of looking for payphones on Google Street View and saying, well, and then you've got to go back in time and it's, oh, it was there then, it was there then, it was there then. No, it's not there anymore. Well, yeah. Um, so, you know, I was doing all of this from home, really, fortunately, but I wasn't having to, to drive around. Um, but yeah, the, the number of payphones was really falling. Um, so then it was a case of, you know, prepping for the nationwide event. So this was just mostly refining our data. Um, we ran some, some brief tests, so overnight at kind of five in the morning, I was calling a whole selection of payphones every night and seeing which ones were still giving me back, giving me ringing, just waiting for a ringing and hanging up. So it's tiny short calls that weren't connecting, um, spread out so we weren't kind of noticeable as uh, through any kind of, you know, error, error um, reporting or something on BT. And just trying to kind of keep on top of cleaning that data up and, and making sure it was still relevant. Um, and that takes us to 1st Jan 2021. So as you'll probably also notice, you know, the whole COVID thing in the middle of this as well didn't particularly help. Um, fortunately, I can't be, I think we were in whichever tier it was at the time that meant that with some discussion with lawyers and things, it was like, well, if people, are go, people can go out for a walk, if they're going to a pay phone by themselves, this is, you know, this is, this is perfectly, perfectly acceptable. Um, so we, we did our nationwide event. We had at that point 17,000 numbers in our database. Um, we placed, that should be 10,000 calls placed, there's a typo in my slides there. Um, but so there was, ten, so 17,000 numbers in the database. When we actually made the calls, 10,000 calls came back with, with a successful ringing kind of message and 900 of them were answered. And that's over, I think, about half an hour. So between 11 a.m. and 11.30 on New Year's Day, um, 900 people picked or the phones were answered, whether or, you know, not all of them went. And, and there was a, a reason why it was quite a long audio piece, which, which we'll show you at the end. Um, but, um, you know, some people did listen all the way through. And there, there was obviously some publicity around this and kind of promotion in different areas and campaigns to, to encourage people to go and, and take part. Yeah. And then we did a, we got in, in, invited to the Compass Festival in Leeds. Um, which was, this, was, this should have been 2020, this was delayed into 2021, um, to, to basically run the, run the project again, just on the phones in Leeds, but every day for, for two weeks. Um, and then there is a short video, which, how are we doing for time? Okay, we can, we'll try the video, whoops. If the sound's up, the HDMI. So this is the, about the project in Leeds really, but the, kind of the project in general. came about five years ago because we had lost a lot of people who had decided to take themselves away from the world and that hurt because I myself have suffered with suicidation. You know, in some ways I felt like I was actually living proof that there can be a way out of that darkness. It's loud in the world these days. Voices raised everywhere. 
all of these friends and colleagues and loved ones were men. The statistics in this area suggested that the lead on this was older men, whereas previously it had been younger men. And at that time, we were working a lot with telecommunication technology, and we thought it would be really incredible to be able to ring all the phone booths because they're just essentially very lonely creatures. And the project just grew from making all the phones ring to actually visiting each and every phone across the whole of Leeds and actually mapping them. And, and this was a project that took volunteers, a huge community of Leeds uh, residents that just signed up for going out and mapping the phones and testing each and every one of them. It's very much a live map and is a snapshot of this moment. We're thinking about removing this payphone. Our research shows that this payphone just isn't used enough for us to carry on running it. Places can also feel unheard. Pockets of communities separated by rivers and hills mean that some areas are perhaps less heard than others. Phone boxes, to me, chimed really well with this feeling of, you know, like obsoleteness, unused, forgotten, like losing that vital service that they once provided. And I felt like that chimed well with this new demographic that we were seeing. Thank you for being with me today. Thank you for listening. Because as it's been said, being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. So that's, yeah, that was the creative um, kind of trailer for it. So what I want to try now, a couple of minutes, is one risky live demo, <laughs> which may break um, the decked infrastructure in here as well, because I don't think we put enough antennas in, but we'll find out how many calls. So if you've got a decked phone, pick up, if you dial that number briefly, it'll just say, thank you for joining um, and hang up on you. That's putting you all into a queue. When I've done that, I'll then initiate something which should make everybody's phone ring, and when you answer, you'll hear the audio piece from the national event. So give it a go, I'll give you a minute or, we've got about a minute, so I'll do that, and then, um, and then we'll see if we can break something. You're getting messages saying thank you, something, yeah. Okay. Has everybody done that off their decked phone? What's it phone? Anybody? I can't really see, but wave if you're still trying to get it to work or something. A couple of people trying. Five, so 555-9001 five, 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 on, on deck. It has to be on the EMF network. It won't work off your, off your regular mobile. But um, you can still hear a few clicks. Okay, that's about a minute, so we're running out of time. Let's see what this does. So if I now call another number. Okay, so we'll see how many ring and then how many can answer is probably our limiting capacity. <laughs> cool. Now you should be hearing the audio piece. Cool. Um, if, you, if you want to try it later, if you do a different number, 9002, that'll just let you dial in and listen to the whole audio piece. If you want to go and try it on like one of the phone booths we have around the site or something, it's kind of quite, quite emotive um, or anything like that, but... Um, yeah, so um, I'll be around outside if you want to ask me questions at the end, but thank you very much. <laughs>